live everywhere. Daily Kos Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kagro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is July 15th, 2020. Time for yet another show. Uh, I checked the calendar the other day, by the way, and uh, found out that uh, my calendar did not, in fact, uh, mark yesterday as Bastille Day. So I'm just glad we all remember it on our own. Otherwise, this would never have... uh, been possible for any of us, but we all remember, I guess, our French history. Uh, Time now to kick things off with uh, the new reality uh, for today's show. By the way, I don't know, I'm assuming he's not actually listening because I do different things with my birthday, but that's just me, my brother. Good uh, good day to you, Brother Mark. Uh, Happy birthday. And uh, we're sending you our cryptic texts reminding you that we have remembered your birthday this time around anyway. So uh, happy birthday. Enjoy the day. Uh, Apparently it is also uh, international mow the goddamn lawn outside of my podcast studio, if you can call it that, window. (laughs) So that's fun. Hopefully that's over with been a rough start to the day uh but so far well uh, no worse than any other day really considering where we are and the news we have to report to you it is wednesday so we're back in the saddle it turns out uh, i had i I thought i had uh, put together a great morning post for yesterday's show and it looks like i never actually published the thing which was too bad because i had lots of fun jokes about uh suddenly going out on a trout fishing vacation which i've planned for some time but forgot to tell you that I had planned uh, ahead of time and even forgot to tell myself that I had a fishing trip planned and uh, also forgot to plan it or decide on where to go, <clears throat> as uh, Tucker Carlson apparently did. We skipped the story, really, for the most part, because it's just not as important as <clears throat> mishandling global pandemics, uh, cheating to try to win an election, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Many things going on. But uh, ready to roll on a new show. Daily Coast Radio is live now. We are reminded reliably all the way from Portland, Maine, where they voted yesterday on uh, uh, nominating the two party nominees for the Senate seat formerly occupied by Susan Collins. Susan Collins apparently thinks she's going to, you know, contest this thing and win the seat back. But that's not likely to happen. Lots of good election news. I'm sure Greg will have that to round up for us. But uh, what do we have? Let's see. What Bill says we've got on tap for you is is this. Uh, Daily Ghost Radio is live now. That assumes, of course, that KGRO X, me, David Waldman, has submitted a transcript ahead of time to a secret government database for processing. We'll see what happens. And that's where we are. I did note this morning <clears throat> one of the stories that we have to share with you uh, at some point today <clears throat> relate to... Well, one we mentioned yesterday that Joan mentioned while she was here uh, during her early visit. I still I, Skype still tells me that uh, doesn't know anything about this this business of Joan calling early. So I don't know. Maybe maybe the thing is just deteriorating bit by bit. Uh, sometimes Greg's calls come through. Sometimes not. You know how that stuff goes. Uh, as a matter of fact, that reminds me I should probably have Skype up top on the screen so that when it does ring, I'll I'll be able to answer it, to, even if it doesn't ring in my headphones. All right, well, we'll see if this works. Uh, but yesterday, Joan, while she was here, noted the story that Mark Sumner had written up for the front page over at Daily Coast, this curious development about sending the National Guard to hospitals. Where, which hospitals, I'm not really sure, but I guess... The idea was Trump was going to, I guess he would be asking any friendly governor, because who else would do it, to dispatch the National Guard to the hospitals, though it was unclear exactly what they hoped would happen there. Uh, You know, uh, they were supposed to, I guess, help gather the data in some way. And, you know, uh, uh, Joan and I were puzzled as to how the National Guard would be of any help with something like that. But uh, between that and yesterday's news that we haven't 
covered today, which will be part of today's news, of course, the strange and mysterious reporting from the New York Times under the headline, Trump administration strips CDC of control of coronavirus data. I don't know how well they've really been doing with the coronavirus data, <clears throat> but uh, the Trump administration obviously is upset with them because they are compiling it and talking about the fact that people have coronavirus, and that's against administration policy. It says here in the subheader, hospitals have been ordered to bypass the CDC and send all patient information to a central database in Washington, raising questions about transparency. So if I understand it correctly, the new plan is that... Uh, Hospitals are now being asked, stop reporting the numbers of COVID-19 patients you have and how many die and all of that uh, nonsense to the CDC, but send it instead directly here to us here in the White House in Washington, D.C. We'll compile those numbers and make sure they're correct. And then we'll be the one to tell the news media how many people have coronavirus and whether it's spreading or whether uh, Donald Trump has miraculously cured it with his orange visage. Has he just, you know, has it in fact gone away with warmer weather, just like leader Trump said it would. And uh, well, I wouldn't be surprised if those were the numbers that they found. But uh, I'm interested in that story in conjunction with the story we mentioned yesterday, that this now begins with not only are we uh, going to compile the data ourselves instead of listening to those stupid scientists who normally count things at the CDC, but right from the beginning, uh, we're now going to send the National Guard to the hospitals to teach those hospitals exactly how to correctly count the numbers which will then be sent not to the CDC, but to the central database in Washington, D.C., under the control of the White House to get those things added up right so that leader Trump can tell us how easily he's defeated the coronavirus. So things are looking up, and I guess this is the end of the pandemic, and we can all go back to school. I did happen to note that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, Hotline Josh, Josh Krashauer, I guess, is uh, uh, has decided that uh, the fact that reopening schools when they polled about the idea in June when schools had just closed and they were saying, well, you know, how, how will we do with reopening schools in the fall? Apparently only 31% of respondents at that point had any problem with reopening schools. But as soon as he, the way he puts it, as soon as Trump started to champion reopening schools, the jump, the number jumped to 51% opposing reopening the schools. And he reaches the conclusion that this can only be due to irrational Trump hatred and partisanship, as opposed to our having spent June saying, well, surely we must have a plan for safely reopening the schools. Yes. And the answer in July was no. Well, go back to school and shut up about it. And if you die, you die. We just have to learn to live with it. And uh, if you don't like teaching schools, uh, find something new.org will help you get something different. And uh, that obviously is now the notion of reopening with no plan and with little trickles of numbers from a couple of college kids having parties and getting COVID-19 turning into another full-blown outbreak in 25 states. Uh, that's not the reason that the idea of reopening schools with no plan is, por- is polling poorly. It's irrational Trump hatred that's doing it. So it's a good thing that Josh has his finger on the pulse of the nation and uh, here to pry that finger off of the pulse and replace it with a better one is Greg Dworkin. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. They stopped mowing the lawn here. That's good. Um, I guess everybody's out of the Bastille by now. They've had 24 Well, you know, hours. The, the important thing is that today is uh, St. Swithin's Day. You knew that, <laughs> right? St. Swiffer? I think I have one. Swithin's. That's W-I-T-H-E-N. No. Apostrophe. Yeah, St. Swithin's Day. Welsh uh, saint. Name? Okay. Oh, you well, see, that the could problem be pronounced is, and or so goes the story. He wasn't a particularly powerful or, or uh, uh, miraculous saint. I think he only had one miracle. That's the minimum. Uh, what happened is uh, somebody, uh, a, a, a Welsh housewife, yes. you know, I, I guess this is like sixth century or something like that. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't, I didn't look that oh, part up. I don't up. know. Anyway, a, a Welsh housewife uh, stumbled across the saint and was so surprised she dropped her basket of eggs, and miraculously, they didn't break. Or if they did break, they got put back together. So that's his main miracle. Saint Humpty Dumpty is what we're yes, about. exactly. <laughs> this is all right. Wow. But but uh, of I'm course, he's more up. famous for what happened after he died. 
Uh, he was a famous uh, nature lover and wanted to be buried outside and was so uh, oh. allowed for 100 years or so. And then ah. uh, people decided, you know, he's such a great saint and local and, and uh, he's one of ours, so we're going to build a, a nice uh, uh, a shrine for him and move yes. him there. And the, the day he was he moved, it started that. to get stormy, and there was like 40 days of stormy weather, 40 days and 40 nights, stormy uh, giving the impression that he didn't really like being moved. And huh. so uh, the local legend became that if it rains on St. Swithin's Day, it's going to be pretty bad weather for weeks to come. But, All you know, right. it's kind of like Groundhog Day. But, you know, if it's beautiful weather, then you'll have beautiful weather for oh. weeks to come. So it's raining here. here. Oh, okay. And, and it's St. Swithin's Day, so we're all doomed. This is not just in Wales. Anywhere? Well, apparently. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that, that is fascinating. I like doing the – I love hearing the story. I, I've looked it up now. We, I will share the uh, Wikipedia – entry page with you in the roundup you can learn all about swithin and uh yeah look at that uh, yeah uh, in the uh, in the little summary that they have on the google page uh, attributes they list for him he's a bishop uh holding a bridge we don't know about that one yet and broken eggs at his feet that's those are the little notes that's the cliff's notes from Wikipedia on Swithin, so cool. But it doesn't say anything about raining or not raining. Eh? Uh, no, but I bet uh, in the fuller narrative it is there. So if right. the well, in the fuller narrative, the, uh, the tiny you ship know, is tossed, Trump is, uh, to is screwing up mightily. Let's uh, yeah. uh, touch base on this uh, uh, CDC HHS uh, data story. Okay. Oh, there's a okay. Norwegian and, and try to put this in perspective. Too. It's ridiculous and it's absurd and it's not going to work. But let's just start with that. But if you step back a little bit, yes. Okay. Nobody now. in the public. Yes. Nobody in the public is using CDC data. Uh, yeah. C CDC gathers its okay. data by fax machine <laughs> from all the different public health departments and collates it. And by the end of the week, Saint they put machine. together. This is what happened last week. Hmm. Nobody wants it. Too old. Okay. Okay. That whole system needs to be redone. So that's where some of this impetus comes from. Right. And unfortunately, Where one of the people impetus? who is pushing change is one of the least trusted people in uh, Washington right now, Debbie Burks, oh. who had the idea to help to send the National Guard. And, and her original letter was her demanding idea. it and then actually had to pull back and say, well, if you want, you can do this <laughs> because she had uh, all sorts of pushback from yeah. the, the she, governors who she said, had what no the hell are you talking whatsoever? about? Is that one? So, so the concept is they're not getting good information and they would rather have good information. Okay, that's, you know, semi-acceptable. Yeah, but sure. the, the ham-handed way that they do that, of course, is uh, totally unkosher. Ham-handed. And it just, right. it's not being accepted. Swithin's eggs. And, uh, and, and the fact of the matter is that everybody gets their information from COVID Tracker and Johns Hopkins. So if you want to send yeah. the information anywhere, send it to Hopkins. Let I them guess that's it. true. Yeah, what worried me a little bit was I did see somebody noting, you know, the CDC data isn't really actually particularly useful for people who are trying to track it in real time, and hospitals no. will still send their information to the things people are really using, like Hopkins yes, uh, and but, the New York but, Times tracker. But the federal government uses yeah. that and tries to calibrate their response. For example, you may remember the disastrous one week ago uh, task remember. force meeting where Mike Pence and Debbie Burks tried to make the case that everything was under control, uh, stay calm, you know, like at the end of yeah. Animal House. Everything's under control, well. or, or maybe Leslie Nielsen in one of the uh, uh, Top Gun <laughs> movies, uh, Naked Gun movies. The, yes. the whole idea is that uh, everything's under control and things are leveling out and we're in a good place. Mm. And, of course, that was obviously not true because, you know, Florida and Arizona and Texas – uh, are, are needing uh, refrigerated uh, trucks yes. to help supplement their morgues. Those are not good places. Those are not good uh, statistics, but not the kind of thing that you want. So somebody had the brilliant idea, probably not Burks, but uh, the, the impetus was to try to get better information. But, of course, it's the Trump administration, so the end result product is, why don't you send everything to Michael Caputo, who is the mm. Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs over at HHS, yeah. and a Trump loyal this and nutcase, and I'll massage the data, and I'll let you know what you need to know. And, obviously, that's not going down very well. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then but it's not going to change anything. Throw the military in there, too. It, uh, like if you still want to send your data in the, to Johns Hopkins, maybe this bayonet will change your mind. Right. The, the thing that 
is most surprising about it is is that they then said, okay, and in addition to trying to, quote, fix the problem, end quote, do not send the information to CDC. Mm. And uh, that's to save them fax toner. Uh, probably. But the thing is, at that Sending particular you, point right? in time, you have to look back and say, why doesn't somebody at CDC resign over this? Yeah, uh, like the, the main counting person or something. Okay, well, mm, that, that's a, it's an odd combination of policies. And I would love to know just psychologically where Burks got the idea that she should open her mouth and words should come out of it to the effect of, I hereby command the United States military to do this thing for me. It's bizarre. But what again, that, that's about? what the reports say. So, uh, you know, it's it's uh, Nancy Messonnier hasn't true. been heard since uh, February when she told us a pandemic was coming. I mean, right. that's exactly the kind of public health people we need to hear from. Right. And we she especially to need to hear from it the disease. because so at this particular point in time, stepping back and looking at the big picture and then honing in on schools and schools reopening, nobody trusts the Trump administration. Nobody trusts Burks. Nobody mm -hmm. trusts Pence. They certainly don't trust Michael Caputo. They don't trust that they're going to get the right information. We know it's all going to be politically massaged and it's not working. And so at this particular point in time, you look at the polls. Uh, there's a new one coming out uh, from uh, a Monmouth uh, today on Pennsylvania, which is a live caller poll and people are going to pay attention to it. But there are others. There's a uh, 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 CNBC polls today, for example, uh, mm -hmm. on some of the swing states from uh, uh, looking at, at uh, uh, Biden's position in uh, the swing states, and it's pretty strong in most of them. So uh, uh, the whole problem is that uh, Trump is losing on this and he's losing trust. And so now he has to try and make the case, despite the fact that the public stepping back and saying, you know, this is Katrina. We've lost trust. It doesn't matter what you say anymore. It just doesn't make any difference. This isn't really an election. It's a countdown. Somebody very smart uh, watching some of the numbers told me. Hmm. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what is he doing? He's trying to convince everybody that the best way for him to be reelected is to open up the economy and get everybody back in school. And by the way, it's good for you too, but that's not really what, what's important. What's important is what's good for me, says Donald mm, Trump. Probably. And people aren't buying it. They're just not buying it. Well, and so he's getting frustrated. No he can't do his uh, signature rallies. He tried that in Tulsa. It didn't work. Yeah, he tried to do that in New Hampshire. Go. It got canceled. Well, uh, the convention in Jacksonville is falling apart. Nobody wants to go, and it's going to be outside in 90-degree heat and, and a really stupid idea in the middle of yeah. hurricane season. They're all going to get West and Nile. so he decided that he was going to use the Rose Garden to give essentially a campaign rally speech, which horrified the uh, even the White House reporters who well, were used to just about everything. Totally legal and normal. Why? Uh, uh, totally legal, but not totally normal. Oh. And uh, he looked so incoherent. Uh, it led to many stories about, well, Trump is not only losing, but he can't figure out how to lay a glove on Biden because oh. all the stuff he's trying just isn't working. And bringing up Hunter Biden is only reminding people he got impeached over that. It, that's true. That's one of the one of the downsides of uh, staying there and sitting there and, and repeating the same charges over and over again. Right. Yes. So, you know, you have that some new ones. Um and if that's the case, you know, you have to step back and ask what he's doing. So he has this push for school. How is that going? Let me give you three polls that came out in the last 24 hours. Axios Ipsos poll, Americans fear return to school. How much of a risk to your health and well-being is sending your child to school in the fall? 71% say it's a large or moderate risk. 82% Democrats, 53% Republicans. Republicans care about their kids, too. Uh, as Axios likes to do, they they mm -hmm. like to do this uh, little uh, framing yeah. discussion. If you don't have the pe uh, wherewithal and, and attention span to read the whole story, why it matters. <laughs> President Trump and Education this? Secretary Betsy DeVos, and they're brief things, but if you don't have you know right. the attention span to do the brief thing, then here's a briefer thing. President Trump <laughs> and Education Secretary Betsy DeVos have threatened to withhold federal funds from schools that don't reopen. The new findings suggest this pressure campaign could backfire with many of the voters to whom Trump is trying to appeal ahead of the election. People don't like being threatened and having their cash taken away? Uh, Cliff Young, president yeah, of Ipsos U.S. Self. Public Affairs, says Americans at this point, and parents more specifically, cannot be force-fed policies that go against what they think. 
You can't wish away or scare away a virus. And right now they're not feeling safe in putting their children back in school. There's also serious political risk for Trump and Republicans, because even the Republican base sees a risk in putting kids back in school in the fall. So that's Axios Ipsos. Ipsos. This is uh, Politico Morning Consult. Voters reject Trump insistence that schools reopen. The Politico Morning Consult poll finds 65 percent of voters oppose Trump's threat to cut federal funding for schools that don't reopen. A majority of voters oppose the Trump administration's demand that K-12 schools and daycare centers be fully open for in-person instruction during the coming academic year. In addition, a decisive 65 percent of voters reject President Donald Trump's threat to cut federal funding for schools. Only 22 percent said schools should have the federal money reduced if they don't fully reopen. So that's his true base, 22 percent. Okay. Well, now we know. And then this is Navigator. Navigator comes oh. out with their polls on Wednesdays. Key takeaways, Trump approval matches its lowest point in Navigator history going back to April 2018. It's now 39 percent, disapproved 59 percent. A majority of Americans and parents oppose reopening schools in the fall. You hear, uh, there's a theme here. You get this uh, familiar theme? Because of the risks, and nearly two and three parents say schools school. should be among the last things to reopen. Hmm. The public, including parents, trust state and local government over Trump to handle reopening schools and would prefer he stay out of it. <laughs> well... Yes, that's surprising. Right. As Trump's approval remains negative, his ratings on his handling of the economy are the worst they've been in our tracking, with a majority of Americans disapproving. 45 approve, 53 disapprove. Okay. In March, it was plus 10. Now it's minus 8. Huh. That's, that's subtracting the uh, approve from disapprove. Bad. Or disapprove from approve, I should say. Okay. Okay. Uh, minus 27 on the George Floyd protest, minus 25 on the coronavirus pandemic. Oh. And the minus 25 is a change from the plus 10 it was in March. Yes. Health care minus 21, plus. down from minus 2. And job as president, minus 20, down from minus 2. So from March to July, those four months, Trump's ratings have plummeted. And going back to one of the points that you were making in the opening, with Josh Krauschauer talking about this poll, tying it to, well, uh, Trump says yes, so therefore the country says no. Actually, the virus was happening during that time, yes. and that's really what's driving everything, okay. including people's reluctance to go back to school. But, yeah, there is a, a, a sense at this point is that Trump is lying to us. He doesn't know what he's talking about, and I don't trust him. And so it's going to be a problem. They have one of those, uh, you know, word clouds. Yeah. In, right. in a few words, what negative things have you seen, read, or heard recently about Donald Trump? The biggest one? Mm -hmm. Coronavirus. The second oh, okay. biggest one? Uh, COVID. Schools. The <laughs> oh, third okay. biggest one? Reopen. Wow. Okay. That, that'll that do the trick. Okay. So uh, if, you, if you see where this is going, that matches all the other polls. Giant. Moron. And so he's trying to convince mm. people to do something that they don't want to do, and it ain't working. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sure Ivanka's kids will go back, though. Yeah. Well, Ivanka's currently pushing Goya right now. Right. That's not slang. She's, she's, I gotta she's actually some pushing sort of, going. Some sort of yeah, <laughs> weird. All right. Difference. I found those uh, CNBC polls that I was referring ah. to. Uh, Biden holds an edge over Trump in Arizona, Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and virtually tied in North Carolina. Interesting okay. about North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, this is Change Richard's polls. Not my favorite pollster, but here, here it goes. Arizona, Biden 51, Trump 45. Florida, Biden 50, Trump 43. Michigan, Biden, 48, Trump, 42. If you mm -hmm. are to believe these polls. That's what okay, they're meant to do. Uh, the, uh, Biden has a bigger lead in Florida than Michigan. Oh, yeah. I see. Uh, North Carolina, Biden, 47, Trump, 46. Interesting mm -hmm. here with uh, Pennsylvania, Biden, 50, Trump, 42, and Wisconsin, Biden, 48, Trump, 42. So that's why the uh, Monmouth. Uh, research poll coming out today on Pennsylvania is going to be so interesting. They usually uh, post the early afternoon. Uh, but North Carolina, yeah. and I've been in discussion with this with some of the political scientists who are familiar, more, way more familiar with these states than I am. I've always maintained that Arizona is an easier get than North Carolina, and I don't exactly know why. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, sure, Arizona is hit with the virus, but so is North Carolina. Arizona is right. a very uh, elderly population relative to some of the other states. Texas is very young, for example. Yeah. Um, okay. But North Carolina is just stubbornly 
50 percent no matter mm. what you do you know whoever wins north carolina is going to be like a point or two it's like florida used to be mm. okay uh whereas florida is like <laughs> no we got a lot of old people here and they're trying to kill us so we're not into it right yeah and you don't even really have to try to kill them either uh, but but he's actively trying. Yes, right. There's just uh, people don't like to be rushed with these things. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, but the, the stubbornness of North Carolina is just an interesting thing in and of itself, and, mm. and certainly something that uh, that bears watching. Yes. Uh, and especially uh, if uh, it's true that people are just getting tired of Trump, we'll see. You know how that breaks. We'll just see how that goes. Okay. Texas, yes. of course, uh, is famous for uh, uh, Texas is for Democrats. What New Jersey is to Republicans. <laughs> Sometimes it looks tantalizingly close, but yeah, nah, okay. can't pull it off. Okay. So uh, does Biden sink a lot of money in Texas? He's going to put some ads in there and mm -hmm. maybe he'll try to help some of the down ballot people. But it's unless there's a complete total blowout, which is not impossible. <clears throat> it's really unlikely that Biden's going to go all in in Texas. And it's really unlikely that Biden's going to take Texas this time around. Yeah. OK. Texas is right well, for the taking in, in four years, but not so much now. OK. I've been wondering when that year would come because they've been threatening that for a long time. But for different reasons. Yeah. It used to be that. And, and this is interesting. We'll get back to our Colin Woodward 11 nations discussion. Right. It used to be the what? Democrats would salivate over Texas because obviously it's a big, important state. Yeah. But the rising uh, Latino uh, population yes. suggested that Texas would be there for the for the taking. But that's not happening. It's really the suburban voters that are going to push Texas close this time. Hmm. It's a completely different group than the Democrats were counting on. We'll talk about why after the break. All right. Well, too many groups running around. That's the problem. And we would know what was happening. If we could just limit it to one or two, we would all understand things a lot better. But then what would we do in the mornings, right? There'd be nothing for mm -hmm. us to do. All right, we'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We, uh, we never stop. We just have our own uh, discussions that the rest of you uh, will have to pay extra to hear one day. I don't know. Maybe one day I could cash in on all of the conversations. But then you'll all be sorely disappointed. I assure you, if you pay good money for these conversations, they're interesting. I just don't think you should part with dollars for them. Anyway, yes, Greg, let's continue on. Uh, we, we, we already had part of the conversation. Dang, now I'm done. But nobody else heard it. The uh, 11 nations that you were Yeah, uh, Colin with. Woodard uh, wrote an article uh, talking about response to pandemic. But, you know, it is based on a book that he wrote called American Nations, A History of the 11 Rival Regional Cultures of North America. And he hones in on some of them. And, uh, you know, in his introduction to the book, which I've been reading lately, uh, he's very good about uh, crediting the historians who came up with a lot of these ideas. He didn't, you know, fully uh, uh, invent all of this. But when you look at his map, Fair enough. he has Yankeedom, uh, which is basically New England and upstate New York. And then New York itself is actually part of New Netherlands, and that includes Southern Connecticut, where I live now, and New York, where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And just south of that is Tidewater. Yes, uh, I remember this. But uh, Virginia's broken in half, and it also includes uh, the Midlands part, which is uh, more Midwestern, and Appalachia, of course. And then south of that is uh, the Deep South. Yeah. And uh, the parts west that are most interesting is... Uh, uh, Northern New Mexico, uh, northern Mexico, I should say, southern New Mexico, and uh, parts of uh, southern Texas, which are part of what he calls El Norte. Yes. Then there's the far west, which, you know, which is the Idaho, Utah. And then there's the far left, which is the west coast strip 
uh, in California that's on the ocean. Mm -hmm. And of course, anybody who knows California knows that the coastal Californians are quite different than the inland Californians who are much yes. more far west people. Yeah. Very conservative. Okay. Right. The inland empire, as they called it. Yeah, but also, you know, includes oh, part sure. of, uh, of uh, Orange County. Yeah. The and place where you won't wear masks, you know, for, for uh, uh, going oh, back yeah. to school. So sure. uh, the far west people are reacting quite differently to the pandemic because, uh, according to Colin Woodard's thesis, yes. these places were all settled by folks who had a particular idea about their approach to government. And even as they are replaced uh, by immigrants and generations and such, the original ethos that held the individual places together still sticks. Mm -hmm. So Massachusetts is still very much uh, uh, government oriented, greater good, commonwealth. How can we approach this where everybody, you know, benefits? Because uh, we think this is right and, and we're, we're zealots about it, in fact. You know, good government, it's our duty, you are owed if you are in a position of wealth to participate in the greater good, you know, so you have the Lowells and the Lodges and the Cabots who just felt the government service was a thing. Mm. Yeah, uh, it is. And, just... and New Netherlands is more mercantile, uh, more into capitalism. Anything goes because it'll make you money. And that includes New York and parts of uh, Southern Connecticut that feed into New York with commuters. That's where I'm from. I'm from New York and I live in Southern Connecticut now. So I'm definitely part of Yankee territory and not uh, Red Sox nation. Gotcha. You know, and yeah. so it, it all fits with that. Tidewater, uh, which is the eastern part of Virginia, uh, for example, yes. uh, landed gentry, second sons of the Brits coming here to try to establish uh, their their manners. And uh, you had the Lees of Virginia and, and uh, you know, all the, all the people from 1776 singing about it. Uh, yes. And uh, that doesn't include the western parts of Virginia, which are more greater Appalachia and parts of the Midlands. And you're in a you're in a border county because you're yes. part of the Midlands, too. Uh, I, I'm and the Midlands are described as people who are basically your average everyday Joe who are uh, somewhat apathetic about both government and politics, which we still see to this day. And so you have all those people, who, you know, who who are saying, I don't I hate politics. I only look at politics when I have to, as opposed to the uh, New York, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Yankee uh, uh combo here who are yeah. fascinated by politics because it helps to govern. And the Midlanders say, you know, govern schmovern. I just want to, like, live my life. Leave me alone. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not uh, I'm not violent about it. The far west people are like libertarian. Leave me alone. And so that's quite right. different. And all of that affects your response to crises like the pandemic. We won't get into too much at the deep south here. The deep south were the basically slave traders and uh, they were at war and still are at war for many years with uh, the northerners because mm -hmm. the New Netherland people in New York and the Yankee dumb people from uh, New England are allied in that. And they're allied with the far west. And so they have one point of view and the deep South people basically are allied with the, uh, uh, the, the far West libertarians and the Appalachians and, uh, you know, want to resist all of this stuff. And so these attitudes still pervade everything, including whether or not you want to wear a mask. Don't uh, tell me yeah. what to do. You can't tell me what to do. I hate no. central government. You're trying to take my stuff. Yes, that's uh, well, that's how they feel about it. Unfortunately, I've seen some. Right. So seen it, it, it all fits, you know, it's not perfect, but uh, it all fits. And, and in any case, uh, the idea that the uh, El Norte people uh, coming up uh, are yes. basically descendants of uh, Spanish Catholicism and oh. uh, resented by the Protestant everywhere else. And so mm. the anti-Mexican, anti-Catholic point of view has been. Uh, embedded in some of these uh, uh, nation areas that uh, Colin oh, yeah. Woodard describes for just so long, it's very difficult to get over that prejudice. And that's where you see it today. Like, why do you hate Mexicans so much? Well, because, you know, going back to the 30 years war, they're Catholics and we're Protestants. And so you have to hate them. No, it's in the rules, I guess. It's in okay. the rules. Hmm. You know, I, you know, I don't even remember why anymore. That's where it originally came from. Of course, it's different now. We don't feel that way, but but we feel that way. I just can't even tell you why. It's just one of those things. Come together over Goya products. Yeah, and taco trucks in every corner. Hmm. Seems to be popular. Taco Bell right. doing so, very well in this. So country. there's a lot to that. 
Um, and sometimes people don't exactly think through why they feel the way they feel. In fact, most don't. Uh, but again, it, 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 it uh, infuses everything. And so when you're trying to make changes for the greater good, like a Yankee person would say, you're up against these uh, uh, inherent structural resistances that you may not even be aware of. Hmm. All right. Well, now we're aware anyway. Well, now we're aware. Anyway, so uh, does that change anything? Well, it just, you know, yeah. uh, it, it makes you realize that you can't be Debbie Birch and just order everybody what to do. Nah, probably not. Doesn't work. Well, okay. You could give it a shot. I suppose you're entitled to try in this administration. You can persuade, but you can't order. And, yes. uh, you know, uh, Trump's supposed greatest skill was persuading people things. That's why Scott Adams was so, uh, you know, really? the Dilbert guy was so yeah. enamored of Trump. Oh, He's a great see. persuader. He can persuade people to do this or that. But, of course, in what sense? Uh, as we said the other day, if you don't try, you'll never be forgiven for that. And he's not trying to persuade people to wear masks. He's not trying to persuade people that he's got a handle on the pandemic. He's trying to persuade people that it doesn't exist. It's not a problem. Yeah. And well, it's perfectly safe to open up the schools in the fall. And that's just not going to fly. I guess that's it. He was very persuasive when the things he was persuading you about didn't particularly matter. That you, right. Know, if you exactly. felt like spending money on his idiotic golden thing, then fine. And he could persuade you to do that. Uh, uh, it might be good vodka. I don't know. I'll drink it and find out. It could be a good steak. Why not? Maybe I'll play golf here. But as opposed to, like, how about maybe laying down your life for the country? Well, they haven't really made the case for me on that one. Well, what if I just lie and say I have? Well, it works for selling condos sometimes if you have disposable sometimes. cash and uh, the rest of the stuff probably not. Right. What a great persuasion. So this, uh, getting back to reality here, uh, so this is uh, against uh, NBC News. Inside the Trump campaign struggle to land a punch on Biden. President Donald Trump's lengthy attacks on Joe Biden on Tuesday may not have been all his political advisors envisioned. And they've bluntly no. told him he can't win the November election if the campaign is about him. And for weeks, they unsuccessfully urged him to pivot to a hmm. new strategy focused on his general election opponent, Joe Biden. Now, comes expecting Trump to pivot, of course, is well. we've talked about that from Van Jones to Dana Bash. People have waited for that. It ain't happening. Mm -hmm. And you can't win the November election if the campaign is about him. Narrator voice. The campaign is about him. He's oh, the incumbent well. president. And he's a narcissist. How could it not be about him? Yes. What about that is going to change in the next four months, three months? And if it doesn't change in the next three months, then why do you think you could win? And the answer is, well, it can't. And so he can't. And so that's why I'm saying it feels more like a countdown than it does an election mm. at this point. Yeah. All right. Well, we should have a clock. Uh, all countdowns need a CNN clock. Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, forecasting the U.S. election, the economist model that uh, G. Elliott Morris helped put together. Mm -hmm. And it, I remember uh, I was telling you it wildly fluctuated between 89 percent chance of Biden winning oh, yes. and 90 percent chance of Joe Biden winning. Right. Well, today, today it's 92. So there must be something Ooh. terribly wrong with it. They're going to have to recalibrate it. Maybe the spring is broken. Hmm. Nah. The battery's worn down. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's just the election is not going well. well for Trump and the pressure's getting to him. And he's not that... Uh, coherent on his best day and as uh, his uh, niece mary trump is her name yes uh, has, has uh, famously said in her book and given interviews about he's not a stable person and uh, he doesn't really respond well to pressure and we are seeing it so he goes to the rose garden yesterday and is completely incoherent and gets everybody mad yeah uh, including his own his own team apparently right. Meanwhile, USA Today has this one. Even Senate races have caught COVID-19, boosting Democrats' chances of winning control of the chamber. You can find places on Twitter where the Republican uh, uh, operatives, lobbyists, and others are whispering to each other, I think he's going to lose. And so uh, I haven't seen any recently, but I'll be quite interested uh, to see what the uh, polls that ask, who do you think is going to win, uh, are going to say. Because uh, for a long time, well, yes, but Trump is still the incumbent and he's going to win because 2016 and this thing and everything else. So uh, it will be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, if you look at uh, predict it for the uh, election uh, right. now in terms of how it looks, Biden, Trump, um, it's uh, pretty heavily Biden, but not heavily enough. You know, it's got uh, Biden okay. at like uh, 65 
when the Economist model has it at like 92. Ah. All so right. it, it, it's exactly uh, predicted who's going to win is exactly paralleling the uh, Trump job approval. You okay. know, it's like 41, hmm. you know, 56, 57 or so. Um, but his chances of winning are a lot lower than that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad. But can we move it up? Yeah, well, that's the thing. Everybody would like to have the election now. If, yeah, right. uh, but uh, you can't. That's going to be people's new answer. If the election were held today, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, but it was just supposed to be a setup for the rest of the question. No more questions. Thank right, you. We're just, done. Just end right there. Uh, oh. Let's see. We haven't had an update on the MSN tracking poll in a long, long time. Uh, so we don't know where that's going. And it hasn't been updated since the 9th. So I, I have to write uh, David Rothschild and see what's going on with that. Yeah, what's going uh, on? With Rothschild. civics polling, though, uh, we still have uh, you know pretty steady uh, 41 approve, 55 disapprove. Uh, and that uh, changed back uh, when the Senate coronavirus hearings were happening and Fauci was testifying. Uh, it was uh, basically uh, 4354, and now it's changed all the way to 4155. That doesn't sound like a lot. But for this poll, it is because it basically doesn't move. And so the poll shifted slightly after the hearings, and it's stayed that way ever since. So it's it's basically a 14, 15-point uh, gap. And uh, uh, Trump isn't really in a position uh, to change that. The uh, averages mm. for uh, 538 are still uh, an 8.7 uh, lead for Biden. But when you look at individual states, Biden is hitting 50 in the national polls. Michigan is a plus 8.9, Pennsylvania plus 7.3 for Biden, Wisconsin a plus 7.4, Arizona plus 2.3. And uh, that doesn't even mention Florida uh, with the uh, big problems that we're having right now with Florida and with those numbers. So uh, when you look at all of that, uh, let's see what we got for Florida from Real Clear Politics. They have a Biden plus 6.4. Uh, in North Carolina, they have Biden plus two. And okay. uh, again, uh, all of that is uh, suggestive of uh, things not really changing very much. Hmm. And yet we would like things to change very much. Well, we'd like it to speed How up. Can we put we this don't really together? Want to change it. We, we like the way it is. I'm looking at the numbers from uh, the daily cases we do get from the uh, COVID tracking oh, folks. Those numbers, yes. And uh, it still looks pretty grim. I mean, there's hints of maybe getting a little bit better. California is still rising. Florida uh, definitely rising. And the worst case of the four states I'm going to mention, Texas uh, is still rising. Arizona appears to have hit a peak with testing, but that may be because they just don't have enough testing. Right. When you look at their percent positives, it's still pretty high. Mm -hmm. The currently hospitalized, on the other hand, are, are grimmer. Uh, again, California rising, Florida definitely rising, Texas rising, and, and Arizona still rising. And the uh, deaths are uh, not in a good uh, shape right now. As I mentioned, the uh, refrigerated morgue trucks for Arizona and Texas and soon mm -hmm. Florida, um, you know, are, are telling you that story. And uh, the way I like to look at it, uh, one of the sites actually lets you look at uh, normalized by population so you get a better sense of what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and if you normalize by population, Arizona's deaths are way above Florida, Texas, and California. Yes. So uh, for that reason, Arizona remains an epicenter, but it's just not as populous a state as Florida, which remains the epicenter. Mm -hmm. which, uh, which site are you using for the, the normalized numbers? So that's a site uh, which is uh, called 91-divoc.com. Uh, okay. Right. I'll just give you. Oh, I see. Uh, that is, it's, I, I just entered it, and the, the line here is, let's flip the script on COVID-19. That's it's the COVID one. It's COVID-19 backwards. Gotcha. Yeah. 91 Divoc. That's hilarious, but, well. Uh, now you can understand it. Uh, calling out the, the the URL by letter was like, wait, you what? Nine one. I get you. Covid nineteen backwards dot com. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I've been looking around for that, and I, I have a couple of alternatives people have sent me because uh, I like to have You those can use world meters You can just get numbers, yeah, but these have nice graphs, and I, my mind processes the graphs better. Oh, okay. I like to have the uh, data normalized by population because uh, it, it uncovers interesting things before the other systems report them. It, I, I was able to see from looking at the normalized uh, by population, looking at the new cases reported daily by population, that Arizona was up and coming. And so, you know, f I guess uh, four or six weeks ago, you could see Arizona rising to the top of the chart normalized by population, but not by sheer numbers because of the size of its population. Uh, that and, and one that still remained hidden from view largely, Arkansas, uh, right. huge problem as well. Uh, the other thing it allows you to do is it, it uh, allows you to look at regions if you want to. Yeah, okay. You know, so you can look at just the Northeast or Midwest or, you know, Should uh, hook up compare with one of, some of those. Um, and the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 trackers uh, allow you to do that as well. Any way you look at it, there are some hints of maybe we've hit the worst, but then you step back and look at the stories and realize we haven't, and that's where that lag period takes place. Okay. And I think politically the most important is that uh, the numbers, uh, and there are uh, polls on this, Gallup just had one, the Republican governor's numbers are just crashing and burning, especially people like uh, Ron DeSantis. It's just well, so clear he's over his head and he doesn't know what to do. He should be. And burning. Florida is burning. He's getting heckled now at his news conferences. <laughs> yes, I saw that. The uh circulating on Twitter the other day. I mean, it was it was nice to see. Not not very creative heckling. The good kind. Like, no, you just you suck. You're terrible at what you do. Yeah, Doesn't you're not doing anything. Creative. You're not helping us. Right. The, the thing is that Ron DeSantis's position is simply untenable. You yes. know, he cannot hold this as Florida explodes. So the pressure is going to be enormous to do something different. It happened with Greg Abbott who was forced to uh, you know, start uh, suggesting everybody wear a mask. Mm -hmm. California's locked down. Arizona did some things, but not enough. And they say they're going to wait and see what happens and then make decisions. But, of course, since the lag period is what it is, by the time you make the right decision, you're already two weeks too late in terms of uh, what kind of effect yeah. you see. And for some reason, the Republican governors are just too stubborn or too mm. stupid or to understand that. And yeah. so, you know, it's, it's just phenomenal to me that they continue to resist doing the right thing. And then they're going to be forced to. We all know that. Yeah. Well, uh Sounds like uh, the the political analysis of it is they're afraid to have separation from from Trump. That Trump will well, not just them. that they're afraid to admit they made a mistake. Mm, yeah, I mean that's it's their that's, own doing. That's Everybody human understands and that that it's their own doing in their individual states that that they're responsible for, not yeah. what Trump says. Right. And people aren't mad at them because they didn't break with Trump. They're mad at them because they're picking the wrong thing to do, and then they're too stubborn to refuse, yeah. you know, well, to admit that they made too. a mistake and then change. They're dealing with two separate issues and solving, well, not solving, two separate problems. Uh, nobody's mad at them for, uh, you know, for, for how they make their decisions, uh, uh, but they're mad at them for the decisions themselves. Yeah, because when the outcome is bad, you're responsible. Right. You're yeah. the governor. Right. I mean, you don't get to do that and say, well, I blame Trump because I was just blindly following him. Well, see, now you're in trouble for blindly following someone. We elected you to lead and all right. Well, I don't know who thought Ron DeSantis was going to lead anything, but you know, but that is were weird. that is the the uh, yeah. prevailing political myth that the governors lead, and so this is exposing all the governors in terms of who can and who can't. It's pretty remarkable. Okay. Yes, and uh, well, I guess we have to wait uh, to get rid of them too. If if only those elections were held today. Right. Uh, unfortunately, they're not. Uh, let me see if I can just uh, dig up that one for you and give you the Gallup link. Uh, GOP governors losing resident support on COVID-19, writes Amy Walter. Let me just give you the tweet because that's the one that has the messaging from Gallup. And there you mm -hmm. go. Ratings of state governors handling a coronavirus slipped in past month. Governor ratings are down most sharply in Republican states. Within GOP states, independence views have soured the most. So, uh, you know, people may think this is partisan, but I think it's totally fair to step back and say there is, in fact, a Republican policy on handling the pandemic. Yeah. And it's a bad one. It's basically built on ignoring it and pretending it doesn't exist. And it's failing. OK. 
Well, no one could have predicted that. Uh, well, you know, everybody could have predicted that. By which While governors' ratings no one... for communicating about the virus and caring about their communities are down slightly, this is not uniform across the country, but varies by the party of the sitting governor. For this analysis, residents were sorted into two groups based on the political party of the governor. This includes residents in the 26 states currently held by Republicans and 24 states led by Democratic governors and clear declines in residents' ratings to the governor and Republican-led states as a whole, an 11-point decrease from 54 to 43 most recently. In those agreeing, the governor's communicating a clear plan of action for addressing the pandemic, and an 8-point decline from 61 to 53. In those agreeing, their governor cares about the safety and health of the community. But specifically, that's uh, Republicans. Meanwhile, there's been no meaningful change in the governor ratings of residents in Democratic-led states as a whole. So even if you think that uh, on the whole, the governor is representing you and your party, if it's a Republican governor, you still think they're doing a worse job than you did back in June. Mm. And again, that goes back to the comment you made about Josh Kraschauer thinking that uh, people don't want to go back to school because they're anti-Trump. Yeah, right. Well, these Republicans aren't Mm -hmm. anti-Republican. They just recognize (laughs) that the pandemic's a big deal and their own governor and their own party's doing a bad job. Yes. Although, interestingly, it is driving more than a few Republicans to admit, uh, you know what, I might be anti-Republican now. Well, you know, again, I think the the main point at this particular uh, moment in time is that people won't feel comfortable and certainly don't feel comfortable about sending the kids back to school until public health says it's okay. Yeah. And that means trusting Fauci and people like him, which is why it's all the more remarkable that Peter Navarro puts a piece <laughs> in USA Today yeah, saying right. that I'm right and Fauci's wrong. And every time we've interacted, I've been right and he's been wrong because I'm right about everything. And uh, then the White House says, well, that was an unauthorized piece that we didn't uh, yeah. know was coming. Also not. But Navarro true. still has his job. Yeah. I don't know. I wonder what their it's curious relationship they have with him that uh, you can get away with these unauthorized pieces that are that are also wrong and backwards. But I mean, well, that's that's because, number you. one, they're authorized and B, ah, he didn't okay. lose his job. Therefore, they said it was OK. Yeah. Well, OK, I guess that's it. I mean, do you, hmm. <sighs> plausible deniability. Trump isn't really saying this. It's yeah, only oh, Peter okay. Navarro that's saying it. But of course, yeah. we didn't fire him and we didn't discipline him and we didn't uh, reprimand him and we didn't say it wasn't true. But don't blame it on us. Like if it goes over well, it was authorized. And if it doesn't, then we don't know how that happened. Well, the other idea is, look, we're having a terrible time with this election. We can't beat Biden. Maybe we can beat Fauci. Maybe not, but let's give it a shot. OK, if he's let's run against him. Sure. Let's let's come up with opposition so. research and treat it as if it were hmm. a political campaign. Yeah, that is a remarkable thing. I, I mean, something we haven't really stopped to comment on because it's so uh, par for the course for 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 the Trump administration. Well, you know, of course they're releasing oppo on uh, whoever their target is, and then you realize that when was the last time they ever had opposition research on a like a an NIH functionary? Never, because. There's no there's no election for it. There's no re- how would you release to in what context would you release opposition research on a doctor at uh, the uh, I forget where they base him in the in the health departments there. But um, it's repeated every time we read the article and I ignore it to try to get to the good stuff. But uh, yeah, I've never I've, no, no one has dossiers on them because why you never would need to. Uh, they're just telling you what the facts are. Sometimes there's bad news, but you, and you can spin the facts, but we've never, you know, had opposition research released before on encyclopedia salesmen, you know? Hmm. So anyway, yeah, there were some elections. You mentioned that. Uh, oh, we yes, should right. Mention them. Sure. Tommy Tuberville has put uh, Jeff Sessions to bed. He's gone. Yes. Another one of those, uh, everything Trump touches dies. And that yeah. includes Jeff Sessions' ignominious career. Yes. Uh, we have uh, MJ Hager winning in uh, Texas. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sarah Gidden, of course, winning in uh, Maine, as expected. Yeah. And uh, let's see, are there other big ones? Uh, a lot of people tweeting about their things today. I don't know whether it's well, big Well, there's individual to uh, house races, yes. uh, you know, some of which uh, we had contests like in Texas where uh, mm-hmm. Ted Cruz supported one person and Donald Trump supported <laughs> another person. I think the Trump supporting uh, candidate uh, was the one that won. 
I'm sure we got a bunch of QAnon candidates who are now going to be in the general oh, election. Yeah, Pete Sessions made a comeback. Uh, he won his primary in a, a different district, I think. So he's going to wind up being back in Congress because it's a red district, unless things go not like people think. Mm. So uh, the Sessions comebacks were one out of two. Yeah. Um, Ronnie Jackson. Ronnie Jackson, did he win? Yes. Can, Ronnie Candyman Jackson. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought you might he might be covered by the QAnon umbrella, but I'm not sure. Oh yeah, he is. Okay. Uh, so he might be in Congress as well. Awesome. Uh, maybe uh, we shall see. Trump is losing. But again, when you're running speak. a very red district, your chances are great. So really, the election is in the primary there. So you know that's all. That's all I have to say about that, as far as Gump used to say. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, that's fine. We're Let's call it a let's call it a segment then, because it's about to my little alarm's about to ring and then we'll play the music in thirty seconds. And I think that no, was well timed. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. I want to check in on all the. Uh, we have to. Someone will have to give us a comprehensive count of Q and on. Uh, right. One one thing uh, to take you right up to the break. Oh, Charlie yes. Anderson tweets a great piece on who stands to take the hit if the six hundred dollar per week is allowed to expire, mm. as. Uh, Ryan Nunn notes, who wrote the article, this would take as much as $19 billion per week out of people's incomes at a really difficult time. Is that the bad? weekly GDP is about $414 billion, so this is a 4.6% hit if it expires. Lots of pressure on Congress to act. Yeah. Well, some people might consider that to be a good thing. I don't know. Uh, the part about well, if they don't act, like, well, that's great because acting is tough and hard thing to do. I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, Joan mentioned this, of course, they'll be under some tremendous pressure, but, uh, you know, half of the Congress is Republican and they genuinely think it's fantastic for people to run out of money because it will incentivize them to find something new.org and get a new job thanks to Ivanka Trump's program. All right. Thanks, Greg. We'll check in with you tomorrow. We have that luxury and uh, see you then. Okay. See you then. Welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Ed Roots Radio. There's uh, much to cover and uh, no time to do it, I guess, maybe. We'll uh, try and uh, run through a couple of these stories that we have tucked away in pocket and take a look through the Twitter feed and keep an eye on things as time goes on. You never know when uh, Trump will uh, disrupt everything by saying something outrageous and crazy, either uh, live in the Rose Garden, which was a huge violation of all sorts of ethical standards, uh, et cetera, rules against campaigning from the White House. But, of course, uh, those aren't enforceable uh, as against uh, the president, both because, one, it's Donald Trump, and, two, we have the stupid carve-out of the Hatch Act for the president because it's supposed to be difficult for him to be able to always be towing the line because he has both a political and policy role, but this president doesn't have any policy roles, so it's easy to see when he oversteps those bounds. Uh, but that goes hand in hand with the other complaint about which nothing will be done from yesterday. Ivanka Trump's promotion, I guess if you call it that, of Goya products because of the stupid Goya controversy, if if it even is one. Remember the uh, CEO of the Goya line <clears throat> went to the White House and I don't even know what he was doing there, by the way. I never did bother to find out either because the controversy overshadowed whatever it was he thought he was accomplishing there. Uh, you know, with praise for Donald Trump. And then, of course, that causes backlash. And the, I guess the chief consuming audience is it, uh, the chief pool of consumers of Goya products have every reason, for instance, to, let's say, be in opposition to Donald Trump and his policies, and I guess called for a Goya boycott. Not clear how effective that's going to be. Uh, I mean, ordinarily, those sorts of boycotts, I don't think, go anywhere. And uh, it's very difficult to convince consumers to change their behavior, especially if they're not particularly tuned into politics. But on the other hand, the the uh, for Goya products and their their consumer profile, I think, is such that uh, you don't really have to make a tremendous inroads <clears throat> among their consumers in order to have perhaps a measurable impact with a uh, with a boycott, if only because their demographics are so narrowly concentrated. Goya products don't leak out of the 
Hispanic, Latina community, all that far and wide. I mean, they're available on the shelves, but for the most part, uh, um, un- unless the consumers are, you know, uh, traditionally attuned to using Goya products, black beans can be found from any number of other suppliers. Uh, but it's pretty intensive, I think, inside of the Hispanic and Latine community. And uh, it may just it may just catch fire. But at any rate, it doesn't matter because it'll almost assuredly be offset by the number of super conservative Trump supporting white people who will buy their first can of Goya beans. I'm not certain that they know what they're going to do with those cans or the beans inside, for that matter. But uh, yeah, anyway, so she photographed herself in an awkward sort of spokesmodel pose, holding up a can of Goya beans and uh, repeating their their advertising tagline, right? Which I, I, I don't know if it still is, but uh, it feels like an older commercial. But the, if it's Goya, it's it has to be good, which has always felt like a, a ripoff of the Smuckers line. But anyway, uh, yes, that is a uh, ethical violation. Lots of people pointing that out. You can't, uh, you shouldn't be having the president's daughter and a White House advisor boosting the products of a company whose CEO had political praise for Trump, but F you, uh, come and arrest me for it. Nobody's going to charge me with anything, so I'm just going to get away with it and do the thing. So infuriating, but I wouldn't spend a great deal of time on it. Uh, uh, Similarly, uh, Kanye West, uh, not infuriating to find out that he has dropped his purported presidential bid. I think that was good for about 48 hours uh, nobody, I don't think, ever really believed that he was running for president, but because he's Kanye West, he gets to have people t- t- pay attention briefly when he says so. Uh, that's now over with, and I have no further information or interest <laughs> in that to share with you. So uh, there you go. But I just thought I would note it, and Greg thought it was uh, wise to uh, make sure that we we did tell you that that had happened because, you know, he's a popular entertainer and people like to keep track of such things. All right. Let's see. Um, as we mentioned up at the top of the show, the strange confluence of uh, bypassing the CDC with hospital data and sending the National Guard to hospitals is a very weird and suspicious looking combination. As it turns out, just as we were saying so, Mark Sumner was saying so as well and publishing a story that has since appeared on the front page up at the top, uh, Daily Coast, the scheme to bypass the CDC and send the National Guard to hospitals looks suspicious because it is. And that's good news. We, we were right. In the middle of a massive pandemic, seems the perfect time to revise the format in which states share information, reroute that information so it bypasses the CDC, and employ the National Guard to make sure that individual hospitals are entering the data, quote, right. If the latest White House scheme looks like a blatant effort to solve the pandemic by simply changing the data, well, yes, it does. With Donald Trump claiming that increases in cases are due to testing, please ignore the filing, uh, filling hospitals and growing deaths, putting the numbers in the hands of the White House is an invitation to turn the basic information of the crisis into the basis of propaganda. As far back as April, right-wing media was reporting that New York hospitals were exaggerating the number of cases and even accused healthcare locations of using mannequins to make it seem that emergency rooms and hospital beds were full. Sure, of course. Hospitals were accused of exaggerating cases and of miscategorizing deaths to make COVID-19 seem more serious. Why? Social media was peppered with videos of people breaking into ERs to prove, quote unquote, prove that they weren't really that busy. Even before the epidemic exploded in the United States, sources on the right were insisting that COVID-19 was not as deadly as it seemed, not as widespread as people claimed, not a thing at all even. With Trump repeatedly using the word hoax to describe the pandemic, There are still people in the United States who don't believe the coronavirus exists at all. And there are far more Trump followers ready to believe that the numbers of cases and deaths are being exaggerated. If it seems impossible that a significant number of deaths of COVID-19 could be covered up in the United States, 
It takes no more than a quick review to see that this is already happening. Multiple states have rules that record only the specific cause of death for those who die in hospitals or have their death certified by a medical examiner. Early on in the U.S. epidemic, this resulted in instances where hundreds of people who had died in nursing homes or thousands who had died in their own homes were not included in the tallies. For the most part, these hidden deaths have been gradually added into the total, though not always smoothly. Reports have shown that both around the world and in the United States, deaths from COVID-19 continues to be a significant, uh, continue to be significantly undercounted. As early as April, investigators located over 9,000 deaths that had gone unrecorded. There are also states like Florida, which is already engaged in multiple steps designed to hide information and give Republican Governor Ron DeSantis ultimate control of what the public sees. In April, Florida changed the process by which medical examiners report daily causes of death, taking what had been public information at the county level and creating a single list under the control of the state. This effort included threatening medical examiners who continued to release information by telling them they were in violation of, quote, privacy laws. In May, Florida fired the data scientist behind their state-level information site after she complained that the state was hiding data, and DeSantis was accused of deliberately under-reporting cases in order to make his reopening plan seem more reasonable. When that data scientist created her own site in June, it showed that DeSantis was exaggerating the number of people tested by 400,000 and was hiding hospitalization information. In response, DeSantis claimed that the data scientist was under criminal investigation and that her data was not valid. The disaster in Florida is, for the moment at least, so large that it's become impossible to hide. But DeSantis certainly gave it a solid try, maybe with Trump's help. This might work. Yeah, the White House effort to gain control of coronavirus data looks suspicious because it is suspicious. The biggest problem for states reporting confirmed cases and deaths almost seven months into this epidemic remain a shortage of test materials, not data entry. While the invitation to have the National Guard member practicing, a National Guard member practicing military accountancy at every hospital may be voluntary, is that right? It almost certainly, it's almost certain to be taken up by red state governors in the states where the case counts are climbing most quickly. And even for the states that don't go along, the bypassing of the CDC is going to happen anyway. HHS has built a new data hotel. All the data flows in, and what happens next is entirely up to Trump. So, cool. That should be fine. Uh, and of course, the comments uh, wondering, where is the national outcry? It's it's here. We're doing it right now. It just doesn't matter to people like Trump. I guess they're just going to. Well, who knows? Uh, they could be just rolling the dice and saying the hell with it. We'll go into the election uh, spinning as hard as we can or we'll cheat or we'll refuse to leave or something along those lines. And uh, well, we'll have to deal with it later. I did happen to see the other day and I don't think I bothered to put it away in pocket because I don't know I did uh, what do you know all right I, I I guess I was just sort of like well this is important to read the headline of but do we really want to read the story well we'll find out the Daily Beast has this piece which I guess is relatively short so maybe we can actually read it uh, the headline says it all though I think I got to get the pop-up ads out of the way first Hillary Clinton we have to be ready if Trump doesn't go quietly Well, we've all been thinking that, but uh, it's a rare thing, I think, usually, to have someone of Hillary Clinton's stature say so out loud. But she's got a lot less to lose these days, I suppose. So uh, I guess she feels free to say it. Although I don't, you know, I I think uh, if somehow we had uh, decided to nominate her again, I don't think that she would have held her tongue on this one either. I think it's, it's pretty widespread. Wide, widely held sentiment. Clinton, it says here, also explained why Trump had to commute Roger Stone's sentence in order to cover up his illegitimate 2016 victory. Matt Wilstein covering here, uh, I guess the, the basis of the story, Hillary Clinton's appearance on The Daily Show and uh, her socially distanced interview via, well, who knows what they used to do the interview. Maybe It used to be you do these things via satellite, but now in... Uh, 
in uh, solidarity with the rest of us, they do them by Skype so that the video is terrible, just like it is for you and me. Trevor Noah returned from a two-week July 4th break with a very big guest, Hillary Clinton. Daily Show's host began his remote interview by asking the former Secretary of State what she's been up to during quarantine. Because I know if I was in your position, I would spend most of my time tweeting, I told you so, and I would walk around the street just looking at people saying, it could have been me, could have been me. <laughs> it's not, not a bad idea. Well, she answers, you know, before the lockdown, I was doing all of that. Clinton joked in response, I mean, there's probably video, and there is. But things turned more serious when Noah asked Clinton how she's feeling about the 2020 race. It seems like America is on an ominous path to a November date when there's going to be a lot of questions in and around the election, the host said. Donald Trump is vehemently against mail-in voting. What do you make of this, and what do you think the path is to getting people the easiest access to casting their votes? And she answered that Republicans will try to prevent as many people who they think won't vote for them from voting, specifically young people, African-Americans, Hispanics. Beyond that, Noah wanted to know if Clinton thinks Trump will try to undermine the legitimacy of the entire election if he loses. And, uh, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't answer yes to that. In 2016, he said, you know, we'll see what happens. I'm not sure I would accept the outcome of the election. So nothing new there, I guess. But, uh, well, I think it's a fair point to raise as to whether or not if he loses, he's going to go quietly or not, Hillary answers. And we have to be ready for that. But there have been so many academic studies and other analyses which point out that it's just an inaccurate, fraudulent claim. Steering the conversation back to the real danger of voter suppression and foreign interference, Clinton has, so that's a responsible enough answer, right? Uh, she said, look, I want a fair election. If people get to vote, and they, for whatever reason, vote Donald vote for Donald Trump. Okay, we'll accept it. Not happily. All right, so she hasn't changed much there. You know what? I think we can probably just drop this at this point. The headline seems like a bit of a red herring. Yeah, we have to be ready for it, but uh, she wasn't ready to endorse the very real possibility that we might actually see that happen. Still too far-fetched for her. Huh? Seems, uh, seems odd, given that he had hinted that he wouldn't accept the outcome of the 2016 election if he lost that one. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, let's see. Moving on. Uh, let's see. We'll review the things from the last couple of days. This was a surprise to me. Um, and uh, I don't know how much time to spend on this one, but maybe I'll just recommend that we all take a look and read it right alongside the Wikipedia entry for Swithin. Uh, piece of history that I don't think I was aware of from the Washington Post. The headline caught my eye this morning. They lost the Civil War and fled to Brazil. Their de descendants refused to take down the Confederate flag. I think we did manage to squeeze this in at the beginning. That explains the world's second largest outbreak of COVID-19 being in Brazil, though. I mean, that and, you know, population and other demographics. But uh, still, um, it, it is odd that of all the countries in the world that it should uh, take root in, that the biggest outbreaks still at this point, months down the road, should be in the United States and Brazil. It can't really just be that uh, they're the two largest populations of Confederate descendants, could it? That's too simplistic. Don't you think? What's the real correlation there? I don't know. But an interesting topic for discussion. Terrence McCoy has written this article uh, for The Post. It's from July 11th, and I, I missed it the first time around. Uh, just let's get a taste of uh, the, the the topic here to Marina Lee Colba, Colbacini. Or, or I don't know whether it says Colbacini or Colbacini, C-O-L-B-A-C-H-I-N-I, -I, to Marina Lee here. It was a family tradition. Each spring, she would join the throngs who descended on a nondescript city in southern Brazil, don a 19th century hoop skirt, and square dance to country music. I would have questions about that tradition taking root in Brazil too, but I guess this is like the uh, the the uh, conversos, the crypto uh, Jewish population of the Southwest fleeing old Spain as uh, Ferdinand and Isabella uh, kicked off the purge of Jews and expelled the Jews from Spain, and they went overseas, in many cases, to the overseas colonies, and uh, hid their Judaism under a veneer of fake 
Catholicism and then secretly practiced Judaism uh, at home. And it, it went on for centuries and over the generations. And uh, somewhere along the way, for many of them anyway, it was lost uh, on them as to why they were doing this. I imagine for the first couple of generations, they said, well, we're doing this because we're hiding our Judaism. We had to fake our conversion to Catholicism in order to survive in, in, uh, in this region. Uh, and then I guess they stopped talking about it just to make sure that the secret, I guess, uh, stayed well kept, but interesting. So a similar situation. Here. Why are we pretending we're American Southerners? Oh, we are? Hmm. That's weird. The theme of the annual festival, the Confederate States of America. So they were overt about it. It's one of history's lesser known episodes. After the Civil War, thousands of defeated Southerners came to Brazil to self-exile in a country that still practiced slavery. That makes sense. For decades, their descendants have thrown a massive party that now attracts thousands of people to the twin cities of Americana and Santa Barbara de Oeste to, to celebrate all things Dixie, the Confederate flag everywhere, on flagpoles and knickknacks emblazoned on the dance floor. Oh, that's interesting, stomping on the Confederate flag. I'd be for that. Clutched by men clad in Confederate battle gray, decorating the grounds of the cemetery that holds the remains of veterans of the rebel army, the immigrants known here as the Confederados. So I guess they're not hiding it in any respect. In a country that has long been more preoccupied with class divisions than racism, the Confederate symbols, stripped of their American context, never registered much notice. But now, as the racial reckoning in the United States following the killing of George Floyd inspires a similar re-examination of values in Brazil, that has begun to change. That's very interesting. Brazilians in recent weeks have demanded the removal of the notorious statue in Sao Paulo of a 17th century settler who enslaved indigenous people. Protests for black equality have rumbled through several cities, and in Americana and Santa Barbara do Oeste, the cities founded by the Confederates, Brazilians who have never been to the United States are increasingly asking questions piercingly familiar to Americans. Why should the Confederacy be remembered on a flagpole or in a museum? My mind has been opened to the questions, said Colbacini, 35, whose middle name pays homage to Confederate General Robert E. Lee, in case you hadn't guessed. She attended the festival for most of her life, but has now stopped going. Despite worrying what her community might think, she has begun asking that the flag be taken down. It represents my family's traditions, she said, interesting, but in the entire world, in the United States, they know what it also represents. She's very smart. Well, now she knows her history, or now we know her history as well. Uh, she must have known the whole time, and that's why she's so smart. It's a... Uh, it's a little lengthier than I think we ought to spend the whole day on it, but uh, it sounds like very interesting and good reading, and uh, I'm pleased to have come across it and was pleased to be able to share it with you. We can move on to a couple other topics here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, there was the elections. We covered those. Um, oh, you know, uh, here's something that I definitely put aside just to make sure that we took note of it, a very interesting exchange last night on CNN, I guess, or yesterday evening, following the uh, stupid, pointless, rambling, supposed press conference that just turned into a campaign speech in the Rose Garden. Um, but an interesting exchange here. I guess Jim Acosta was on hand for the event for CNN and was pressed by uh, Anderson Cooper, who was at the anchor's desk, just asking, it I, looks like he's sort of just dumbfounded, flabbergasted by the rambling idiocy that was that event, not the rambling idiocy that is this current show right here. And he asked Acosta, so is there anyone around the president? I guess this happened earlier on, especially in the pandemic. You would see these things famously watching the doctors saying, oh, my God, I can't believe he's doing this. Is there anyone around the president who shakes their head? When they hear him rambling in the Rose Garden like this, Acosta's answer was just murderous, I thought. No, he says, we are down to Kool-Aid drinkers and next of kin here at the Trump White House. There are no more adults who will level with the president. 
that is amazing. But the, the next of kin thing was just a great stab to the heart because, of course, the ridiculous nepotism that goes on in the Trump administration. But yeah, he's now surrounded solely by, as I said, Kool-Aid drinkers who just will never abandon the ship and next of kin who should never be expected to abandon ship. No one will tell the president he's out of his mind and that he can't just lie his way through a global pandemic, not to mention uh, economic disruption, social upheaval, et cetera, et cetera. These are not things that you can solve this way. But I think the pandemic chief among them, just because it, it has a body count and stacks them up uh, a lot faster even than the uh, police brutality issue that we're still grappling with. Not that that supplants it in terms of importance. It just doesn't produce deaths as quickly, which is not a real fun way to have to measure your two major or or, or even several major national issues, how many deaths are are racked up how quickly by them. And it's not a great way to rank their importance either, but it's one metric that's available to you if you want to try to do that. All right. Um, Also, some uh, less than fun news on the COVID-19 front. Uh, I'll just bring it to your attention in the form that Patrick Snyder forwarded it to me and to Greg yesterday from a tweet from Dr. Ali Nouri, uh, who identifies himself in his Twitter profile as molecular biologist, president of the Federation of American Scientists. That rings a bell, right? National Academy of Science Global Diplomacy Roundtable, uh, tweeting COVID facts and running COVID19.FAS, Federation of American Scientists, dot org. COVID19.FAS.org. That sounds like another interesting uh source for our information. I just want to kind of click through and take a look at uh, the format of it. Very nicely organized and laid out here. Um, we'll see whether it's a, maybe in the future becomes a, a major new source. But Ali Nouri's tweet that Patrick shared with us uh, sums up a, well, surprisingly, CDC publication that is very technical in nature. Uh, long story short here is Dr. Nouri says that the report says that the virus is stable in air. Once airborne, this is the big problem we've been talking about, right? The controversy over whether just large respiratory droplets that fall quickly to the ground are responsible for transmitting the COVID-19 uh, disease or whether uh it can, in fact, whether the virus itself can live in smaller aerosolized particles that can float for considerably more than the six feet we are advised to keep apart and then can linger in the air for some time. This says, yes, virus is stable in the air. Once airborne, the SARS-CoV-2 virus retains the ability to infect for at least 16 hours which is pretty remarkable. Are we talking about, uh, I mean, it's hard to know whether they're saying, well, if the particles manage to remain airborne for 16 hours, then yes. I mean, I guess that's more akin to like the way measles was spreading. You could walk into a room where a person infected with measles had been a few hours earlier and, and become infected by breathing in particles in aerosolized, uh, aerosolized uh, particles and aerosolized virus containing particles, I guess will be floating in the air. Now, 16 hours. I don't know whether that's typical, maybe under laboratory conditions, they were able to do this. And I, uh, but it does raise questions in my mind too. Now, like I've been focusing less on the idea of touching surfaces and picking up the virus through touching surfaces. I mean, I'm still remembering to wash my hands vigorously because I'm worried about that as a possibility. But uh, I've gotten away, for instance, from wearing gloves everywhere in favor of just having hand sanitizer with me and washing my hands a lot. Uh, the gloves are actually quite inconvenient. But this is uh, this raises some new possibilities. And I hope we're not talking about, you know, walking through somebody's vapor cloud and 
picking up transmission, transmitting the virus that way. That'd be extraordinarily dangerous. And the kind of thing that freaks me out when I'm out there walking on the sidewalk or walking through the grocery stores, etc. But I didn't think was being borne out. But here it says, yes, uh, it retains its ability to infect for at least 16 hours. Harder and aer- hardier, rather, in aerosols than even SARS-1 or MERS. And this could help explain why the airborne route could be a major culprit. Reminding you, wear your masks, keep your distance, ventilate your buildings. Oh boy, we'll be right back. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for K-Grow in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the K-Grow in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that k in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday. But our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to patreon.com slash kgrox to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Welcome back now to Kgro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see, uh, other things that we can share with you besides that horrible news. There's more, more horrible news that we can uh, share. Uh, Let's see, news from Israel where we love everything that happens there or something like that I think is what normally uh, our conservatives and Trump supporters in this country say. Everything they do is fantastic unless you're talking about their abortion policy, in which case they never heard of it. Uh, Israeli data show school openings were a disaster. That wiped out lockdown gains. We hadn't kept up on how Israel was doing with the coronavirus pandemic because we're not Israeli, so we weren't going to do it. And it wasn't a big splashy story like Brazil or one of the huge outbreaks. They were doing relatively well, but apparently it has fallen apart. Why? We might learn something from that, right? Uh, But here in the United States, uh, I guess we'll send the National Guard to arrest that data and get rid of it. Of one, uh, well, let's see. Should I read you the? Uh, sometimes I think these these subheaders take the punch out of the the key parts of the story that follows. Different publications uh, ruin the stories in different ways. Uh, let me just get right to the body of the story here. Israel's unchecked resurgence of COVID nineteen. I did not even realize that was happening. Was propelled by the abrupt May seventeenth decision to reopen all schools, medical and public health officials have told the Daily Beast. So now we have some data. What happens when you reopen the schools before you've totally eliminated the coronavirus from community spread in your country? The answer is, at least in Israel, disaster. But we're not Israel, or something to that effect. But we might be. The assessment of Israel's trajectory has direct bearing on the heated debate underway in the United States between President Donald Trump, who is demanding a nationwide reopening of schools for what appear to be largely political reasons, and health authorities who caution it could put the wider population at risk. Or Josh Kratchauer, who says it's 100% political and you all just have Trump derangement syndrome. There's no evidence from any country in the world with which we have any sort of relationship. That could point to the fact that reopening schools is uh, perhaps a terrible idea and a uh, very risky vector for spread of the disease, except all of the countries who have reopened schools and had disastrous results. But other than those places, what evidence have you really got? Importantly, on May 17th in Israel, it appeared the virus not only was under control, but defeated Israel reported only 10 new cases of COVID-19 in the entire country that day. It's a small country, but still. In the U.S., the debate is often about reopening schools where the disease is not only not in decline, but surging. Also problematic. On Sunday, for instance, U.S. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos told Chris Wallace on Fox News Sunday, there's nothing in the data that suggests that kids being in school is in any way dangerous. But that's only if you don't look at the data. 
But if you look at something else, you know, I'm looking at this box of rocks. There's nothing in the data that suggests that this is dangerous. Ah, but you're not looking at the data. You're looking at a box of rocks. Different. But uh, if you call them out on that, they'll simply say, well, now we are looking at the data. It's just that the data was collected by the National Guard and sent to my secret shop in Washington, D.C., and was never handled by any doctors or scientists. And now it says the same thing that the box of rocks says, surprisingly enough. Well, anyway, this is not the case in Israel, where the data from June, the last month for which there is a full set of statistics, appear all too clear. The road from anti-coronavirus paradigm to rampant infection in this country of 9 million people, oh, I'm sorry, that country, Israel, of 9 million people, followed... Uh, two months of almost total lockdown. And I guess in these somewhat more highly militarized countries uh, and autocratic countries like China, uh, lockdown is uh, a much more serious business. May 17th, though, was also the day Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, we missed this, and his former rival, Benny Gantz, that we, we were watching that. We never did find out what happened with all that. Well, May 17th was the day the two of them swore in a corona emergency government. They set aside the ongoing uh, craziness and said, let's form a coalition uh, government for the purposes of focusing on defeating the coronavirus in this country. How did they do? Their sole declared purpose, remember, to fight the spread of the virus. Netanyahu's decree that the nation's entire school system would reopen was a political flourish to signal that everything was under control. And they actually had numbers that they could use to argue that. The announcement followed a more cautious experiment of several weeks in which only children in the first, second, and third grades were brought back to classrooms and taught in small, non-intersecting groups called capsules. It's sort of a hybrid move to uh, adopt some portion, perhaps, of the Swedish model where they said uh, the indications at the time... Uh, too early, but the indications at the time were, oh, the kids aren't a major vector. Uh, we can send the youngest ones back to school. But even in Sweden, which is constantly touted by Republicans saying that we ought to reopen, they didn't open the middle and or their equivalent of middle and high schools there. Well, they tried that in Israel, too. Haggai Levine an epidemiologist at the Braun School of Public Health and Community Medicine of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, see again with the titles on, on the doctors, and chairman of the Israeli Association of Public Health Physicians, said there was no measurable increase in contagion while the capsules for young children were being tried out. The association even offered the government an investigation into school-based infections of COVID-19, but was turned down. Then, Levine says, contrary to our advice, the government decided to open the entire system all at once on May 17th. What happened next was entirely predictable. In fact, they predicted it and said, don't do it. But they decided, well, let's do it and see what happens. Now, we think what we predict will happen is this. Uh, and then it happened. They were right. Science. On June 3rd, two weeks Key two weeks. Two weeks after schools opened, more than 244 students and staff were found to test positive for COVID-19. According to the Education Ministry, 2,026 students, teachers, and staff have contracted COVID-19, and 28,147 are in quarantine due to possible contagion. Which I don't see how we avoid that here in the United States, even if somehow we manage to avoid widespread infection. We'll have so many people in quarantine every couple of days that we'll be end up uh, effectively closing the schools again anyhow. So just in the first two weeks of July, 393 kindergartens and schools open for summer programs have been shuttered due to cases of COVID-19. So 393 schools in Israel reclosed. On July 2nd, Eric Fegelding an epidemiologist, maybe Feigl, F-E, I'm not sure exactly how they pronounce it, F-E-I, Feigl, Feigl, I'm not sure. Uh, an epidemiologist and health economist at the Federation of American Scientists tweeted a chart showing Israel's rate of infection 
surging past Europe and fast approaching the disastrous rate in the U.S., noting that it was exactly one month since the reopening of Israeli schools. Two weeks after they reopened, they started to have lots of enough cases and have to reclose the schools. Four weeks after reopening, approaching disaster. The level of school contagion became public last week during testimony provided to Israeli legislators by Udi Kleiner, the health ministry's deputy director of public health services, whose boss had just quit in protest against the government's mishandling of the crisis. Israel now surpasses 1,200 new cases of COVID-19 a day. Remember, they had it down to 10 and then decided to open schools. They now have 1,200 cases a day. It's 10. It'll shortly be going down to zero, they might have said, perhaps, just like our own supposed leadership. On Tuesday, Israel reported 1,681 new cases of COVID-19 infection, its worst result since the outbreak began. The source of the infection explosion can be seen clearly in the numbers from June. As Kleiner told the Knesset, 1,400 Israelis were diagnosed with the disease last month. Of those, 185 caught it at events such as weddings. We know we're not supposed to be going to large weddings. 128 caught it in hospitals. Can't avoid going to the hospital, but... You could hope to avoid spreading it better in the hospital. 113 caught it in the workplaces. Again, people have to go back to work. You got to start the economy, yada, yada. 108 caught it in restaurants, bars, or nightclubs. That's just avoidable. And 116 in synagogues, according to Kleiner. Again, we have our own uh, raft of stories here about people who catch it in church and in synagogues and presumably in mosques, although we don't hear a whole lot of talk about that. Uh, So, again, 128 in the hospital, 185 at weddings, 113 at work, 108 in restaurants and bars and nightclubs, 116 at synagogues, while 657, which is to say 47% of the total, were infected by the coronavirus in schools. What do you know? Not a single school was prepared, says Mohammed Khatib, who teaches public health at the Zefat Academic College and is the epidemiological expert on the health ministry's newly formed advisory committee on the coronavirus in the Arab sector. Adults, including teachers and other employees, brought it into schools, which are, in the end, closed spaces, he said, underscoring the finding that middle school children proved to be the most dangerous vectors. The younger students were more obedient and easier to control in a classroom setting, Khatib said, and had more respect for their teachers. Among high schoolers, well, there, there was a greater ability to understand. But it is in the nature of middle school kids to rebel, to not obey teachers, to not wear masks or keep apart. The Ministry of Health did not respond to questions regarding the breakdown of schools and infections, and accurate, detailed numbers have become harder and harder to come by. Levine, the Hebrew University epidemiologist, said that in general there is no transparency regarding the statistics. Well, I hope we'll fix that. The data is not being made available to epidemiologists, so it's impossible to gauge precisely, but we saw many confirmed cases of COVID-19 in middle schools. It is very possible that that caused the outbreak. The month of June, which began exactly two weeks after Israel's school system was suddenly and shambolically reopened, (laughs) caused... The second wave, Khatib says, whatever else we say, the fact is that schools were not prepared to take students back under the necessary conditions to contain the epidemic. The reopening happened too fast. It was undertaken so quickly that it triggered a very sharp spike and the return to more conservative measures came too little too late, Khatib said, summing up Israel's dilemma. Six weeks after forming an emergency government to handle the pandemic, and one week after promising that a corona czar would be appointed to take charge of the country's haphazard response, Israel seems further than ever from its desired goal. Calls are mounting for a national commission of inquiry to be appointed to investigate the government's dereliction of duty, in the words of former Defense Minister Naftali Bennett. On Sunday, Roni Numa a retired army general who was the only known candidate for the czar job, withdrew his name after realizing he would not be given the authority to 
needed to coordinate a national response. Netanyahu devoted Monday to attempting to fire Yifat Sasha Biton, chairwoman of the Knesset's Corona Committee and a member of his own Likud party, for the crime of defying his directives regarding the reopening of public schools and gyms. The prime minister, who's struggling to keep ultra-religious coalition parties in line in the face of their demand to allow synagogues to admit up to 50 congregants at a time, ordered Sasha Beton to keep gyms and pools closed. But without evidence proving that pools and gyms cause an uptick in contagion, Sasha Beton allowed her committee to vote for reopening. How could they not have that data? But okay, I don't know. The health ministry has not released its own epidemiological findings on gyms and pools, if they exist. And the Ministry of Education indicated it intends to open schools as usual on September 1st, even though the numbers from June would seem to provide conclusive data about the risks. In any case, no strategies in place to prevent a second round and third round, really, of school epidemics. Galia Rahav, who chairs the Department of Infectious Diseases at the Sheba Medical Center in Tel Aviv, said in an interview that what happened in schools is just too much gathering day after day, and kids come home and infect mom and dad. The top numbers of new infections were in kids, the ones who don't get it, right? Due to the large number of infections among children, she noted, the average age of an Israeli with COVID-19 has gone down to between 20 and 39, while infections in citizens over 65 have held steady. In Jerusalem, the Israeli city with the highest rate of infection, most of the people with COVID-19 are under the age of 35. It is certainly not impossible that the second wave started in schools, Rahab said, carefully understating the case. Discipline is at an awful level. We know Israelis have terrible discipline, but now it's the leadership that is completely inconstant with one leader saying one thing and another the contrary. Luckily, we'll never have that problem here in the United States, right? Everything is going to be just fine and all the kids will listen and the schools are totally prepared. Except they're not, but shut up and go back anyway. Very interesting. All right, let's see. Uh, we can, oh, I wanted to note yesterday when we were talking about the, we'll just quickly add this, the uh, Roger Stone clemency document that it had been, uh, had the date filled in in, in Sharpie by Trump and that that was somehow like, well, that's a little hinky. We're not really sure that it means anything by itself. But ordinarily, when these things are done uh, in what passes for proper procedure in this administration, those dates are typed in. And maybe there was an indication that this one uh, had been prepared a long time ago and had been sitting waiting for the proper time. Uh, that well, there's never really a proper time to do this, but for the timing of uh, of Trump's choosing, when he, most dramatically he would sign this thing and release it. Um, but there was another theory floated the other day, which was that uh, when Judge Amy Berman Jackson asked to see the documentation, part of the reason she asked to see the documentation, she wasn't doing it for my reason, which is I just never believe that there is documentation. And when I do see that there's documentation, I never believe that it's valid. I need to see the president sign it to, to know. And even then, he's not really the president, but, you know, this is just because I don't want to accept his paperwork. I'll admit as much. Uh, but anyway, she was actually asking to see it because she wanted to know, did the commutation of the sentence apply to all of his sentence? Or was he simply having his prison term commuted? Was he still to be subject to the sentence of supervised probationary release? And was he still to be subject to the civil fine, or I guess criminal fine, that was imposed on him as well. Uh, she needed to, to have the document in order to know what the answer was and what, what, what should she be doing with this case. Uh, so valid point. She wasn't just indulging me in all of that. Um, but it was interesting because she said, well, I, you know, I want to make sure that it covers everything and not just the prison sentence. Cause I don't know, this guy is, I don't know what the pre, I don't know what a competent president would have chosen, even if he did choose to commute the sentence here. I need to know what the president was up to. And, uh, I think she probably suspected that the whole thing was done. It was so slipshod that they probably forgot that that there was anything besides the prison sentence and he might still be subject to probation and a fine. And then the document showed up 
that in fact covered the prison sentence and the fine and the probation, which I think Judge Jackson suspected might not have been covered. But then the fact that it showed up in this document with the date scribbled in at the end, some people were suggesting, means that the the original document, if there ever was one, covered nothing but the prison sentence. And then they heard Judge Jackson say, I need to see the document because if it doesn't cover the probation and the fine, we got another issue. And they went, oh, jeez, and quick printed out a new one and just said, just fill in the date by pen here and we'll just get this thing out the door. And that that's something that they produced after they were uh, uh, confronted in court by Judge Jackson. We don't know that for sure. It's fun to speculate. And uh, so we did it. And that's it. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, let's see. What other uh, fun things can I share in the time that we have left here? Um, how about this scary sounding article? I don't know if we have the time to get through all of it, but I, I like the tenor of it. And uh, it it, it uh, comports nicely with what I've been saying here and on Twitter in the last couple of days in in Salon, Chauncey De Vega, as a matter of fact, uh, the writer on this piece, Dr. John Gartner has this to say, says Chauncey, Donald Trump is the most successful bioterrorist in human history. Psychologist and former Johns Hopkins professor on Trump's pandemic conduct, he's a first degree mass murderer. Oh my, that's putting things rather strongly, don't you think? I like it. The June 6th edition of the German news weekly Der Spiegel described Donald Trump as a fire devil and a president who sets fire to his country. The English edition of Der Spiegel continues with this damningly accurate description of America in the age of Trump. And here it is. Should we be worried about the United States? Is a fundamental shift taking place in a country that is synonymous with deeply rooted democracy? Meh, more or less. The current chaos on the streets of America isn't just the product of the country's economic and societal tensions. The president himself has repeatedly exacerbated those conflicts with his rhetoric. Trump, it seems, needs the chaos. He feeds off it. And now Chauncey takes over again here. Every day he's in office, the political pyromaniac Donald Trump continues to burn the rule of law and democracy. He's shown himself to be the most corrupt president in the history of the United States. The most recent example of Trump's unlimited perfidy. Last Friday, in a naked quid pro quo, Donald Trump commuted the sentence of his longtime confidant and advisor, Roger Stone, as a way of insulating himself from any future charges related to Ru the Russia scandal or other criminal matters. Aided by Trump and his agents' willful malevolence, negligence, and cruelty, the coronavirus pandemic continues to spread across the United States. The country continues its slide toward a second Great Depression as well. More than 135,000 Americans have now been killed by the coronavirus. We actually uh, should be bypassing the 140,000 mark today, another milestone, if you will. Public health experts predict that hundreds of thousands more or more may die in the Trump administration, and Republican governors in states such as Florida and Texas radically alter their public health policies by mandating that masks be worn in public. In some places, lockdowns may need to be reinstated. Instead, though, the Trump administration and its allies have decided that more people, including public school students, their teachers and families, should fall ill and die as a means of creating a new normal where the disease is no longer viewed as an emergency. The evident goal is to sacrifice human beings for capitalism and the economy in order to salvage Donald Trump's re-election chances. This is the economics of barbarism in practice. In total, the United States in the age of Trump and the coronavirus pandemic is a global pariah. Writing at Medium, uh -oh, Indi Samara, Samarajiva, I'm going to guess at the emphasis on that, summarizes this pathetic and pitiful situation. America is not united anymore, and it's barely a state. They've crashed right through the failed state stage, I guess, into a plague state, unwelcome across the world. In the absence of a humane government, America is now ruled by COVID-19. Welcome to the plague states of America. Ultimately, Donald Trump's fascism, his apparent mental pathologies, and his sabotaged response to the coronavirus are not discrete and separate things. They're all connected. Dr. John Gartner, 
whom Chauncey says, I have interviewed on several previous occasions as a psychologist, psychoanalyst, and former professor at the Johns Hopkins University Medical School. Gartner is also the founder of the Duty to Warn PAC an organization working to raise awareness about the dangers to the United States and the world posed by Donald Trump. Gartner is a contributor to the 2017 bestseller, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. 27 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess a president and is featured in the upcoming documentary, Unfit, The Psychology of Donald Trump. In our latest conversation, Gartner warns that Donald Trump is actively using the coronavirus pandemic as a type of biological weapon against the American people. We saw Navarro say that it was a weaponized virus from China. Gardner says it's a weaponized virus from Donald Trump. Gardner also explains how Trump, like other malignant narcissists who attain great power, is willing to hurt and even kill his own followers as a way of satisfying his personal sadism and need for narcissistic energy. It's an energy vampire. That's it. Gartner also explains that Trump's supporters are members of a political death cult in which not wearing a mask and refusing other rational measures to stop the coronavirus pandemic are acts of loyalty and love to their personal savior and great leader. I have some interesting tweet threads to share with you about that tomorrow. This uh, conversation is available actually in podcast form uh, as well as in print here. And uh, I recommend, we're not going to be able to get through the whole thing, but I recommend that you take a look at it or take a listen if you'd rather hear it in that form and uh, get some sense of what it is that's driving Gartner's conclusion. But I think you have some sense of it just by living through the pandemic here in the United States and paying attention to the news along the way. All right, so uh, we'll wrap things up here. Some uh, interesting things to share. Maybe uh, I can point you to... One of the things I discovered yesterday, these, these, um, there, there, there was a interesting video in circulation from some, I guess, probably pretty well known, uh, activists slash pranksters front them out in California, uh, might be familiar to some of you. I have never seen their stuff and just saw their video the other day of the two of them, uh, typical, you know, California beach dude bros, but very funny, very laid back. And uh, walking the streets, offering free masks to those who they happen to see without masks uh, along the beach front and uh, doing so in a very pointed way. That is to say, very open, very friendly, very accepting of no as an answer. But what was really revealing was how furious people got with them regardless when the approach was simply, hey, we're giving out free masks. And notice you don't have a mask. Do you want a mask? You know, the right answer for that for people who are idiots is, no, thanks, that's fine. I actually would prefer not to wear a mask. But then they would push it like saying, oh, okay, I mean, why not? And that would, of course, trigger people to go into their rants about, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, it's very unhealthy to inhale your own carbon monoxide, which is, of course, I love that answer because it's carbon dioxide that is what we actually are exhaling, and that would be the biggest problem. And uh, it usually is indicative of somebody has read this, I guess, on the Internet, that it's, a, that it's a bad thing to inhale carbon monoxide, which it is, but which isn't happening when you're wearing masks. There were some people that just exploded into anger or tried to fight the guys, which they disarm with their California dude bro approach to things. Chad Kroger is the, uh, the guy, uh, one half of this duo, and uh, you may have heard of them, Chad and JT, I think, is the... the name the other guy goes by and they have a whole series there's three great videos of them giving out the masks there's all kinds of other videos you may have seen them uh uh in front of city councils across the country um but chad goes deep is the name of the twitter feed where they had these things parked you might find them very interesting tomorrow we'll uh discuss things well you know we'll be working on all sorts of things tomorrow of course and we'll be returning to this topic, but I can share a, a really fun and uh, entertaining Twitter thread about the ways, the many ways in which the people who have very often insisted that they would do anything to defend their families and their country from threats to their health and safety are finding out that they're actually not all that interested in doing anything at all to protect their families or their country. Uh, in reality, it's just sort of interesting to watch this thing develop. I think uh, 
the, the long form of it was more entertaining and enlightening. But uh, it's put very succinctly here by our friend, the Scott Charles, Scott Charles from Philly, uh, who we follow and recommend that you do too. Just put it this way, his interest is in guns and gun violence very frequently, but also in the public health problem of COVID-19, saying, hey, given that your neighbor with the truck nuts won't even wear a mask to Walmart to help defeat COVID, can we stop pretending now that he was going to use his AR-15 to help defeat ISIS? Okay, I think we can probably... What was it that Marco Rubio said? Let's dispense with the... I can't even remember how he mangled that whole term. Anyway, you got the idea. But a very long, a longer and more entertaining version of that is available tomorrow. I guarantee we will have forgotten about that by now, uh, by that time. Uh, but if we don't, well, let's tune in tomorrow for that. And in the meantime, time to turn things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And uh, just trying to get my buttons pressed right here so I could bring up his summary. I've lost all the time to deliver you that summary. I can assure you, as usual, he will be covering all the topics From we may Daily have Coast lost Radio, past. On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K-Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Here we go. Chief among them that I meant to bring to you but didn't. Now you can tune in and hear it for yourself. A GOP congressman from Kansas was charged with three felonies, including voter fraud. Can you believe this happened in Kansas where Chris Kobach was so dedicated to rooting this out? Once again, they found the voter fraud. And once again, hey, it's Republicans perpetrating it after all.